All right, folks, I want to take you very quickly through the pre-RSI checklist and the uh, airway deep reform. The RSI checklist should be performed before every RSI unless the patient is crash or some other thing absolutely prevents the checklist from being done. The idea is that nursing will be calling out each item and then the docs will respond, uh, check or yes or whatever. Uh, the docs should have already used their own version of this checklist to get everything available so that in an ideal world and hopefully uh, very soon after we implement this, uh, there will be no items that are like, oh, I forgot that because they'll have already done this all. And this is a confirmation rather than a uh, reminder to get these things done. So, uh, and it, it's not, it doesn't behoove nursing to force these things to happen. Um, the, the, the role is really in this checklist to just call it out and hear the docs uh, confirm that indeed they've either done it or thought about it. Okay, so I'm going to go through each one on the list and excuse these formatting errors on the version in front of you. They shouldn't be there, um, but the main stuff remains. So physio issues considered. What the HOP stands for right there is hypotension, oxygenation, and uh, pH issues. And really, you just call it out and the doc say, yeah, we thought about it. What it really means is if the patient's borderline hypotensive, they should have push dose epi at the bedside. They should have used induction agents and um, choices for meds that are safe. So they shouldn't be intubating with 20 mLs of propofol in a guy with a BP is 60 over 40. They probably should be using uh, very low doses of propofol or uh, lower doses of atomidate or ketamine um, because they're hypotensive. And if their oxygenation is 70% before they start, there's a good chance the patient's going to code during the intubation. They should be considering that. And if the patient uh, is breathing 40 times a minute to compensate for their pH of 6.9, they may want to consider changing their approach. So basically, you just read it out and they say yes. All right, induction agent and muscle relaxant are drawn up at the bedside. We'll talk in just a second about the way they should be drawn up, but then um, either you or the docs, depending on who's holding the meds, should say, yes, we got them. Post-tube analgesia and sedation should be called for at the time the decision is being made that this patient will be intubated. So you shouldn't have to push, rock, and accommodate, and then <clears throat> go grab the propofol because there's going to be a period of time the patient will be paralyzed without sedation. So we always have extra nurses in critical care. Someone should be grabbing the propofol at the same time uh, we're grabbing the meds to actually induce the patient. Plus or minus push dose epi, it doesn't need to be there every time. But if the patient is uh, hemodynamically unstable, there should be push dose epi. And uh, it's another topic on how to mix that. Um, and we could talk about that on another session. But uh, calling it out and then it may spur the docs to think, yeah, actually, we probably should have that. And then they may ask you for it or they may draw it up themselves. Failed airway plan verbalized. Someone, either the attending or the resident, should say the entirety of the failed airway plan. This is an example here. They don't need to use this one, but they need to have something very similar to it. So let's very briefly review this failed airway plan. This is the only uh, literature-based failed airway plan, I think, out there. And this is the one I use. And what the resident or the attending will say is the first laryngoscopy will be done by the resident with whatever they choose to use. The second laryngoscopy really should be with a video device and a bougie or a video device with a hyperangulated blade like a GlideScope or a CMAC D blade. The third attempt should be the most experienced person in the room, the ED attending, uh, and they could use whatever they feel most comfortable with. There should be no further uh, attempts at laryngoscopy after those first three, unless the patient has been fully reoxygenated and denitrated, meaning they've been either bagged or they've had a superglottic uh, for three minutes with perfect sats, and only then should a fourth laryngoscopy attempt occur. Now, uh, I want to empower the nurses that if they're at the point uh, where they've failed three laryngoscopies, to 100% of the time, send another nurse to find another ED attending because another pair of eyes can only help in these situations. Um, and uh, that should be the person in your judgment you feel is the most experienced person working in the department right now. So uh, just send another nurse to find another attending and just say, hey, they're having a tough airway. You want to come in and just take a look with them because uh, even just having another calm person in the room, even if they're not actually making attempts, really changes the situation. Uh, and it's worth asking, hey, would you like us to call anesthesia? 
Um, I would not empirically call anesthesia, but asking at this point, three laryngoscopy attempts, uh, do you want us to give anesthesia buzz is a very good thing. Um, what should happen now instead of laryngoscopies is the patient should get an LMA placed. Um, and if that could get the patient sats back up and you get three minutes of bagging the patient with good sats and they want to try additional laryngoscopy, whether it's a second attending or uh, anesthesia or what have you, that's a great place. If they're not getting the sats up with a supraglottic airway, the patient should get a surgical airway. All right, so all of that is in uh, support of the failed airway plan verbalized. That should be said, and everyone in the room should know about it because the nurses should feel empowered that if they're trying the fourth laryngoscopy attempt, but their failed airway plan said, we're only trying three, and then we're placing a supraglottic airway, um, announcing out, no, we all agreed there'd be three attempts and then a supraglottic airway uh, is something that definitely should happen. Uh, you should say crike evaluation. The doc should say yes. What that means is they felt the neck. Okay. The patient's denitrogenated greater than three minutes. You call it out and they should say yes. Or they should say, oh no, crap, we only had the mask on for 30 seconds. And that's what that means is uh, some high flow O2 should be on the patient's face for greater than or equal to three minutes. At box with nasal cannula. You call it out and they should look down at the patient's face, see that there's a nasal cannula on the patient's nose going at 15 and they should say yes. Oxygenated greater than 95%. Uh, before they start the intubation, the patient's sat should be greater than 95%. If it's not, they should really be using CPAP, whether that's a BVM with a PEEP valve uh, or a standard non-invasive machine or the ventilator to get the sats above 95% before they try to intubate. And But you just announce it out and they should say, yep, looking up at the sats, uh, yeah, they're greater than 95%. If they're not, you may want to spur them to say, hey, what about CPAP to pre this patient? All right, you should announce, look in the mouth, uh, are there any dentures and are you, able, are you able to range the neck? Obviously, you want to do this in a patient in spinal mobilization, but this should remind them to actually look in the mouth and see what's in there to see if there's dentures. If there are dentures, they should be left in until right before they put the blade in because it's uh, very helpful for BVM ventilation to have the dentures in. And if the patient's not in spinal mobilization, they should actually move the neck back and forth. All right, positioning. You should call it out and say, is the patient adequately positioned? Um, they should look down and see that the external auditory meatus is at the same horizontal plane as the sternal notch. Um, that's perfect positioning. Call out, or you could check, you know, uh, you could confirm with everyone in the room is that the pulse ox is either visible um, and that it's not on the same arm as the BP. And um, the way I do it is I actually change the orientation of the bed so that it's almost, instead of like uh, the foot of the bed facing the door, the foot of the bed now faces horizontally uh, perpendicular to the uh, entrance of the room. And this way, you as the nurse at the table, the little podium, could see the pulse ox, but then the intubator and the attending could also see the pulse ox. So that's how I position the bed. Um, otherwise, we'll talk in a sec how you could help them to be the audible pulse ox. Um, all right, reliable access that's been tested, it's been flushed, uh, preferably two, but one you could still intubate with if it's reliable. Otherwise, if there's not, and they don't say check to this, um, they really should be just placing an IO if the patient needs to be intubated now. All right, you should call out kit dump on the table. That means <clears throat> all the equipment they need for their failed airway is on a table, like one of those big wood looking wood, you know, pseudo wood tables, not on a crappy mayo stand and not on the patient's bed. Um, there's a BVM on oxygen confirmed, and if the patient has oxygenation problems, there should be a peep valve on the BVM. The capnograph should be on the BVM. It shouldn't be hanging out waiting for an ET tube. It should be on the BVM. So call that out, and they should either say check or crap, and then they should put it on. Uh, there's a video laryngoscope in the room. They might not choose to use that on the first attempt, but it should be there. If they're using video as their first attempt, there should be a backup laryngoscope, a standard, you know, uh, DL laryngoscope there. There should be an oral airway, a bougie, a supraglottic airway, and a scalpel at the bedside. And that oral airway may very well be in the intubation box. Um, the scalpel may very well be in the difficult airway cart, but it needs to be in the room. Uh, if it's a predicted tough intubation, all those things should be out on the bed next to the patient. There should be two suctions with Yang Cowers on, tested, ready to go. Um, you should just call these things out, but the docs should uh, have established that there's someone who knows how to uh, help them with external laryngeal manipulation. There should be someone who helps them with extreme head elevation. There should be someone who helps them with handling the C collar. So just call those out and they should say check. 
And then you should look and they, you should announce and they should say yes. The person, people who are peering over the patient's face, meaning the attending and the resident should be wearing both eye and face protection. And if they're not, then say, hey, you guys should be wearing eye and face protection. Okay, so that's the actual checklist. Uh, as you go through it, you could check them off or you could just say them and uh, confirm that they've said yes, check, or we got it. Yeah, the BVM with the PFAL is there, whatever. But something to confirm before you go to the next choice that, um, yeah, you have all those things. And I would prefer it if you could to just check them off. Okay, we get to this part. Only announce saturations. You are now the audible pulse ox if they can't see the pulse ox themselves. Um, but you shouldn't be saying the sat's now 82, the sat's now 81, because that sets up cognitive barriers. To, they don't need that um, when they're, you know, right around to see the glottis and they're concentrating because it breaks concentration. So the three levels you should be calling out pulse ox in a clear, you know, striking tone to all people in the room is the pulse ox is now 90. You don't need to announce it when it's 89. The pulse ox is now 80%. And the last but not least, the pulse ox is 70. They should get out of there at 90. They definitively should get out of there at 80. And if they're still trying to intubate um, between, when the pulse ox is dropped below 80, that's a bad, bad situation. And they are making a, um, a real risk-benefit choice. And they really should be out of there and placing uh, the BVM on their face and reoxygenating or placing the supraglottic airway. And the key, the reason we talked before about having the capnograph on the BVM is... If they are bagging and there is no waveform capnography being demonstrated, that bag is not working. And one of the things you might want to spur them to say, if you are looking up and they're bagging and there's no waveform, is uh, I think you should try an LMA. And that may remind them that bad bagging with no waveform is not acceptable. It's not going to work. When the SAT hits 70%, um, every 20 seconds or even 10, whatever, uh, you know, based on the situation you feel most appropriate, continue to announce the saturation is below 70%. You may want to change the tone of your voice to really indicate that that's not an acceptable situation and something else should be done before further attempts at laryngoscopy. All right, we talked about the medications, how to draw them up. Um, you shouldn't be asking the docs for how much atominate do you want, how much ketamine do you want, because they, even if they answer you, their answer is wrong because they don't know. They don't know how much they need until right at the moment it's being pushed. So asking them is going to make them give the wrong answer. What we want instead is um, these meds to be drawn up in standard fashion. Um, and each time you're going to be handing the docs standard syringes with their concentration uh, milligrams per ml in it. And you could just tell them the full amount so that they're cognizant of it. Um, so you'll see each of these meds here rock. 10 mLs and a 10 mL syringe, and you say, this is 100 milligrams of rock as you hand it to them. Because um, we want the docs to be pushing the meds. Because you can't push ketamine, you can push Atomidate, you can't push this, you can't push that. It's not good. It should be standardized, meaning a doc should be pushing all meds. Um, now, ketamine 20 mLs and a 20 mL syringe is ideal. We don't have easy availability of these large syringes. I'm trying to change that. And at that point, that's what they should be handed. For now, if you want to hand them 10 mLs of ketamine and have the rest standing by, or um, if they ask for it specifically, two 10 mL syringes, that's fine. But right now, the only place we have these 20 mL syringes is in the tea rooms, and it's ridiculous. And I'm going to try to get them in the green carts, at which point this is the standard way it should be. But ketamine, you drop 20 mLs of ketamine in a 20 mL syringe, you put on the label, and the label shouldn't obscure the actual concentration markers, and you hand it to them, you say, this is 200 milligrams of ketamine. Rock, 10 mLs in a 10 mL syringe. Sucks, 10 mLs in a 10 mLs syringe. Probe, 20 mLs in a 20 mL syringe. Atomidate, 10 mLs in a 10 mL syringe. They may ask you for more. They may say, this patient's morbidly obese. I'll need 20 mLs of Atomidate, and then that's fine. You could either hand them two 10 cc syringes or a 20 cc syringe. All right, the debrief happens after every RSI. It takes about two minutes. Um, nurses are running the questions. Docs and nurses will provide the answers. How many attempts at laryngoscopy were performed? That, an attempt is defined as uh, an entrance and exit of a blade. So if they stick it in, they take it out, they put a different blade in or the same blade in because they reposition the patient, that's uh, now two attempts. So it goes in, it comes out. If it goes in again, then that is when the second attempt occurs. In the opinion of the whole team, not just the docs, nursing, anyone in the room, was there anything that could have been done better? This is confidential. It's not going the patient record. Uh, it's only being seen by my airway QA committee. And we are only, the only thing we care about is making us better each time. So have no fear about putting anything here. Did the team feel like this was a difficult airway? If yes, why? 
was there a desaturation less than 80% with good waveform? It needs to be a good waveform. It always reads like 50, but the waveform is crap. Don't put that down. I'm talking like beautiful hills, flat lines between the hills. Yes, that was less than 80. Just check yes. Was there vomiting after the RS drugs were administered? Yes or no. Was this a delayed sequence intubation? Meaning the patient was given ketamine, pre-oxygenated after the ketamine, and only after that was the paralytic pushed. Um, this is just for study purposes. Uh, was this an awake intubation? Meaning they never paralyzed the patient and the patient was spontaneously breathing throughout. Was anesthesia called? Yes or no. And if they were, why? Was a supraglottic airway placed to rescue a failed airway? Meaning they placed it because the sats were dropping and they weren't able to bag or intubate the patient. Not, as we sometimes do, a supraglottic airway is empirically placed um, to allow us to bag right at the start of intubation. Um, that wouldn't be a no there. Was cricotherotomy performed, yes or no? If it was, email me immediately. Like, as soon as the patient's, um, you know, the, the crike is secured and um, everything's calmed down, email me in real time. Why in real time? Because if I'm around, I will come in and I will intubate the patient from above and then we'll be able to remove the crike. Because once the crike's in, it's very easy to take all the time in the world to perform a fiber optic laryngoscopy and intubate the patient from above and convert out the crike and then they don't have to go upstairs with it. So please, if you remember, um, email me immediately. I'll come in if I'm around. If, I'm, if I don't respond, if I don't come in, uh, just send them upstairs or call ENT or do whatever you would have done normally. After you finish this form, don't place it in the patient's chart. It goes into a folder in the clinician's office. We'll collect them and we'll perform QA on them and there'll be no punitive stuff. It's purely to make us better. Okay, any questions, let Candace or I know and I'll talk to you soon.